So today we're going to talk about the blockchain, cryptocurrency, and Achilles heel in the software development. So this is a, is a kind of a deep technical dive into blockchain technologies. And starting with a question is that um, with all the interest and enthusiasm in the blockchain technology of actually there's a one technology, okay? So blockchain technology. And what the, has the last 50 years of computer science research have not done and failed where blockchain succeeded? What is it? And what's the critical point that we missed and blockchain picked up? And what is the weak point in blockchain technology and that is still uh, suffering? Okay, so you can hear me talking about the, the word start with S, okay, called scalability. Okay, so I'm going to start the talk like this. So it's a, it's a pretty long, but I'm going to get it started. So it's a blockchain, cryptocurrency, and Achilles Hill, the Achilles Hill, for those of you who are developers and have taken computer programming classes, you can hear me saying things that they probably defy your belief. Okay. So here's my outline, and we start with the money and, and cryptocurrencies. So by definition, again, money is any instrument, is any item of verifiable record that is generally accepted as a payment for goods and services, or services, or as a deferred payment, as a debt, or taxes. So anything can hold value. I think the circle is the store of value is any device can be used as a store of value and everybody accept it and it be considered as a currency. Okay, so therefore cryptocurrency, once they gain acceptance by the public or even small fraction of public will be qualified as a currency. So there is a trade in business. I'm not sure uh, you, you, you guys know that called a bartering. So bartering, okay. Bartering actually happens on the coast, coastal cities and where the, where, where the container ships arrive on board and before, before they arrive in a port and uh, the, the contract are canceled or something that happened, disaster happened and uh, the, the owner of the goods cannot pay the bills and a lot of things gonna happen, okay? And then the goods actually just stay in the sea and it wetly and can't, there's no place to go. And then the bartering come, come on board and the people actually will Enter this deal. Say, okay, I'm going to sell the, the the ship of goods and uh, for discount price, and uh, and uh, then we can take the you can take the sea and uh, sell your ship back uh, home. We can take something back from our port. So it's called a bartering, and there's no currency for that. There's no uh, so there's no currency for that. So I'm going to do a good effort, and it's just all cash exchange. So obviously, it's called the interest of RS. Okay, internal revenue said, do we need to charge tax on this or not? This or not? So the, the need for currency is pretty obvious. So you have to have that uh, uh, the item of exchange. So crypto, once the currency is in the acceptance that everybody holding the currency worry about the fraud, inflation, and economic freedom. Now, can I take the money that I have in your store, value store? Can I take the money anywhere? If I'm not allowed, I don't have no freedom. Okay. If the value that I store in your store, in your store, actually we devalue over time, I'm not that interested. Okay. If my money in the uh, in the store can be stolen from me, I'm not interested. Okay. So these are the critical factors for value store. So the problem with the fiat money. Okay, that's uh, U.S. dollars and uh, uh, British pounds and uh, and uh, Chinese yen and uh, and all the RMBs and all stuff, and uh, suffer that problem. Okay, because uh, the government prints money, so U.S. is uh, kind of leading the leading the pack and uh, prints a lot of money. So the more money supply and the 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 lower the value goes. So there was inflation or devaluation of of a, of, of a currency. So these are the things that people worry about. So U.S. dollar used to be a the standard value uh, store for worldwide economies, okay? But uh, now it's suffering because uh, we print too much money and we have too much debt, okay? So a story that uh, cogent to this conversation is a financial crisis, 2008. Two things happened. So can you remember where were you in 2008? 
Adrian, <laughs> you in high school? I was, I was still in high school, but I, I do remember it affecting a lot, including my family, uh, affecting a lot of people, specifically, <laughs> great, somebody was in first grade, specifically, my, my father worked as in, the, in a union, but he lost his job, so definitely felt that effect. So a lot of people felt the, the president of the United States was Obama, okay? When Obama announced that the government will bail out of the, the banks, you know what happened to the trading floor? The trading floor that people yelling at the television, say, Mr. Obama, and uh, if you have the government pay the banks, and that's our money, okay? Next day, the Tea Party was created. So two things happened in 2008. The Tea Party, political opposition against the, the money policy of the government. And the second thing is the Bitcoin. Bitcoin happened in 2008. Okay, two things happened. The guy who allegedly, Satoshi Nakamoto, lost his job as a, a defense contractor, okay, and uh, lost all the savings because of the financial crisis. And said, okay, I'm going to create something that uh, I'm going to keep my values in. So that's how he did all the work. And he said he was so scared and it would be, he, he actually would be, it'd be prosecuted by RS or something. So he, he tried to be enough to this day. Nobody knows who he really is. So there are people who claim uh, there's a, 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 a Dr. Wright was from Miami or Florida claiming he was a, a uh, Satoshi, but he cannot produce the original block, the private key for the original block. So therefore he's a fake. So there are a lot of buzz about this, okay? So, uh, so you know, Greg Wright was the Satoshi. No, it's not, he's not, he's a fake. Now there's, a, if, I don't know, see, this is a link. I'm not gonna show the link, okay? I'll put the link in there and I'll give the slide to Adrian after I'm done with this, okay? So this is recorded. So this is a link, you can click this link and you see a US debt, it's a scary, it's, a, it's called the US debt clock, okay? Every day, the interest grows in millions, okay? Every child born in this country, child, see, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not there, I was not born in this country. So I don't have that problem. Okay, Adrian, you guys do, okay? Everyone born in this country already had a 61,000 debt portion of this national debt. You have that portion in your name. <laughs> okay, so this is scary. Okay, it's scary. So now you can understand why there's interest in cryptocurrency because inflation, the value preservation and the wealth position. Now, second topic is a Web3.0, okay? And... Uh, Achilles Hill in the legacy software development process. So I'm not sure how many people had heard of Web 3.0. Adrian, did you hear about this Web 3.0? I'm sure one of our people here, Sean, might want to chime in. I know he's- Want to chime here. in? Anybody want to chime in? This can be interactive. Yes? I mean, I know a little bit about Web 3. Uh, Shri actually like does development in Web 3 with like NFTs and stuff. So I just, I learn about it. I read about it. Uh, but Tree actually interacts with like the technology itself. So I don't know what he's doing, but maybe he wants to speak in. Okay, now please chime in. Oh, hey, we, have a, we have a full, a full chat. Yeah, Hal Finney. It has to be Hal Finney. Yes, yeah, he's, he's a big success. So he died. Hal Finney died. Okay. He actually, <laughs> yes, yeah, so he's a five. <laughs> you guys are very young. This is a very young crowd, okay? So Helfini died of a blood disease, and um, and he sure had a lot of had a lot of coins by the time of his death. So he has his body frozen, and in hope that that one day medicine will be good enough to get him, uh, you know, become alive again, right? You probably heard a story, okay? That's right, yeah. So Web 3.0 is a graduation from Web 2.0, which we have right now, is decentralized computing, okay? It's decentralized. So instead of having servers uh, owned by any individual organization, so, so everybody is a part of the uh, digital economy. So that was a kind of dream path. And there's a word called DeFi, okay? Decentralized financial service, DeFi. And it's very popular in the crypto community and uh, everybody consider is, is the future. 
And uh, that's uh, pretty much the definition of Web 3.0. And uh, how many people have heard of NFT? NFT. Adrian is, a, is a smiling. We have an NFT creator in here. So <laughs> really? who is an NFT creator? Okay, here is it. Oh, a lot of responses. Yeah, you see, that's the NFT. So you can create NFT for your game object, okay? So if you win some trophies, you can you can put a price tag on. Anybody want this? Okay, that's NFT, right? It's a uniquely identified object in in a, in a, in a three in a Web three point space. So this is a, a is there one slide talk about NFT and Web three point So blockchain protocol actually delivered traditional database that could not deliver, okay? First of all, the blockchain ledger is a fault tolerant, have zero downtime, no downtime. Since the 2008 to now, there's no downtime. Now, other currencies do have a downtime, okay? For example, Solano, okay? Solana, okay? The, Solana was down for 17 hours. Okay, it's a recent event, okay? So there are lots of implementations of blockchain and not really blockchains. So if you see a chain going down for any downtime, and that's not the authentic implement, implementation of blockchain protocol. Blockchain protocol have a zero single point of failure. So it should never it should never crash. It should never crash. I mean, I shouldn't say it should never crash. Probabilistically, okay, we crash if all nodes die. Okay, the only chance for the chain to crash completely is all nodes die at the same time. Now for the blockchain uh, network, for, for the Bitcoin network has a 14,000 computer running at any given moment. Okay, what's the probability of a 14,000 computer die at the same time? It's very, very small, even though it's not zero, but it's very, very small. Since the 2008 to now, there's a zero downtime, okay? And a zero data loss, okay? Now, when I say this, a lot of people say, no, we have heard FBI hijacked, okay? So FBI <laughs> got a colonial pipeline money get back, right? So you remember that? You hear the story? So US company, Colonial Pipeline, got the hacked and got a ransom attack. And the hacker was asking for 7 million payment and the company paid for 2.3. And the FBI was helping get a 3.5 back. And you wonder how did that happen? If blockchain is so secure and FBI can break in, isn't that entire ecosystem of a blockchain, Bitcoin would, would, would have collapsed overnight? Anybody know the answer to that? How did FBI take the money back for Colonial? How did they do uh, that? Didn't they, uh, one of the hackers, uh, didn't store their seed phrase uh, like correctly? No, 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 no. I think they fished. They fished it. Okay. So the vulnerability is always at crypto exchanges. Crypto exchanges. You see, you cannot use a Bitcoin network directly using a wallet. You have to have a wallet to interface with the exchange before you can get to the chain. So the chain itself is really isolated. So all the transaction must go to the exchange. Exchange was implemented, exchange is implemented by the legacy database technologies. So the new cryptocurrency pushers try to come by new exchanges to be more secure. Right now, exchange is the weakest link of the entire crypto industry. So all the heist, you know, all the heists that you have heard in the news and, uh, and the intercept of a cryptocurrency is 100% happen at exchanges. And a $400 million, $2 billion vanish overnight and a theft, it all happened at exchange. And exchange itself can just go shut down because exchange is a single database holding everybody's accounts. <laughs> if, so the owner can, can, can decide, I'll take all the coins and bye bye. I'm gonna, you're not gonna find me anymore. The website disappears. It take all your coins, okay? So exchange is the weakest link. So anyone can store cryptocurrency store values. And if there are enough people that believe in it, and NFT non-fungible tokens, as just I said, you can, you can identify anything that's unique to, to the world and to claim as a single NFT token. And you can put the price tag on. Anybody can, 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 uh, can, can either buy or sell this thing, okay? So decentralized computing sometimes, and in a crypto 
world and community is called Web 3.0. It's called decentralized computing. Now, it's like a pipe dream, okay? But I want to bring your attention to those who actually have been trained in computer programming. So if you haven't done any coding in your academic or non-academic career, in your job or situation, whatever, okay? And you must know what I'm talking about in this slide, okay? You have a servers and you have a scaling dilemma. So every time you add a servers into the mix and you have to face a decision, say, am I going to increase the service performance or I'm going to get the service better reliability? You have to pick your choice. You cannot do both. Now you wonder why is that? Don't you guys wonder this? Why am I adding a server into a mix? And I have to choose either performance or reliability. Why is that? Okay, that's the first question. Say, hey, why is that I have to choose? Now, you can see the next point is a single point of failure cannot be eliminated. Now, what's single point of failure? You have an infrastructure. If any server goes dead, your infrastructure, say, I have to say, oh, like a, like a Solana. Okay, recently, 17 hours. Okay. So all have infrastructure, so network all overwhelmed and a service shut down. Uh -uh, you have a single point of failure. So the only system that I don't have a single point of failure is a blockchain system, actually, that have, don't have a single point of failure. If you have a true blockchain implementation, and you have a zero single point of failure. So no single machine can crash the entire system unless all machines go dead. Okay, and so that's a definition. So for legacy technologies, planned, unplanned downtime is not even preventable. So you hear say temple, okay, our, our Canvas server is on the main, the schedule maintenance over weekend. Okay, because if you go, we have no other, uh, other alternative. So if the server go down, nobody can log in. So why is that? Why is that? We have to log in and I have to have a, all the, the server had to be up. And from blockchain, you have to log in. <laughs> so anybody can become, no, you don't need to log in. You want to become a miner, you don't have to log in. Unless you have a wallet, they have to log in, yes. So now I'm going to give you, uh, the, so because the downtime that cannot be eliminated, especially unplanned downtime not eliminated. So you have a arbitrary data loss. Because every time you have an unplanned downtime, you have arbitrary data loss. So the damage is that, uh, because it's the unplanned downtime, you don't know when this happens. And the data lost, you don't know what get lost. So the financial industry has come up a legal solution for that. So legally, the bank has a rule. If you go to the bank and claim you have lost money and can produce the receipt of your deposit and it can prove that the, your ledger does not match your receipt. And a bank will honestly pay everything they think uh, they agree they owe you and plus interest. So no arguments. Very square a deal. Now question to the audience. How many of you balance your own account every month? I do. Who is that? Me? Sean? Hi. Hi. Sean, thank Sean, you. Thank you. So you're Sean. doing a good job, okay? So nobody has told you the probability of a transaction loss using existing technology is greater than zero. Okay, so if your transaction is lost, who makes the money? You're asking me? I'm, I'm not sure, what do you mean? No, you see, if, you're, if you put the $5 into account, okay, and you forgot to check your balance, okay, and this $5 never appeared in your, in your balance. Okay, who makes the money? Who get the $5? The bank. The bank, the bank is unclaimed yeah. freight. It's called the unclaimed freight. Okay, it's like a bartering situation before. Okay, unclaimed freight. It's, a, it's like a floating on the open sea and without knowing where to go. And the bank says, okay, and now we got the money and no, no owner to claim it. So we have it. Bank being the largest uh, transaction processor. Okay, and they claim a lot of unclaimed freights every year. But they actually, you, you, do, you know, do you guys know what the bank could do to their own transactions? Agent should know, it's from wealth management. 
Hey, sorry, what was that again? I missed that. What do banks do to their own transactions? Knowing that the, the loss of a transaction failure actually is greater than zero. So what do banks do their, to their own transactions? They keep it at the Fed, right? Is that no, no, no. They have an auditor. Uh, it's a person. Yeah. It's a salaried position. And every single bank has it. So you, you don't believe me, you check it. Okay? So go to your local bank and say, do you have an auditor and who audits the database transaction logs? But they don't audit yours. They audit their, theirs. So any transaction did not get go through, and they will retrace it manually. You know what? You know why it has to be manually in this day and age? So it shouldn't be automatic. This is a problem how to do with the cryptocurrency. It's called double spending. You see that? Into technology, it's called a timeout. So I put a five dollars into Adrian's account, okay? And I'm looking for acknowledgement, but I never get it. What do I do? Do I put another five dollars? No, I'm not gonna put another five dollars. I already gave you five dollars, okay? But it turns out, if I don't do five dollars again, and I, I got a timeout, I'm gonna wait for agent to come back to find me. So agent said, hey, "Sorry, Dr. Shi, I never get the five dollars you promised me." So once I check with him, oh, he never got it. I check your bank account. I gave you five dollars back. Okay, An entire manual price. I'm not gonna do automatic. So this is the Achilles heel of uh, all software industries, okay? When I, when I say this, it's a very serious, okay? I'm talking about uh, all installations, universities, banks, insurance companies, military posts, Federal Reserve, okay? Everybody, okay? Customs, and they all have the same problem because we're using the API was a program, actually, program 30 years ago. And with the unreleased assumption, the assumption is the network and the processor will not die. And you know for sure it's not, it's not true. Okay, you have seen plenty crashes. Okay, you know for sure it's not even true. But if you think of your, your entire infrastructure, software infrastructure, Hardware is easy. Hardware is cheap, okay? So hardware is easy. Entire software infrastructure built based on that assumption, what happened to your service? So cameras are shut down, Zoom shut down, it's just a normal sequence. You cannot prevent it. There's no way you can stop it. So the cryptocurrency, especially blockchain protocol has demonstrated, we don't have to go through this. So it is possible to program our own code correctly to have a zero loss, zero downtime, okay? No downtime. All we have to do is to get rid of the assumptions. So the problem is the OPI is in everywhere. You see, you see in everywhere. So MPI means message passing interface, message pay, okay? I wanna communicate from program A to program B and then send a message. Sounds very reasonable, Okay, the problem is what if the receiver is not there? What happened to our messages? It's the same problem like I had before with Adrian say, hey, time out. And all of this, all of those of you have learned programming, has any professor taught you how to do rechain submission? Anybody? I wanna see a show of hands. I see five chat. See, no. Don't you think the professor are not doing the jobs. <laughs> I do. Okay. So I force my student, but only in operating system class. Okay. Not even DevOps and uh, uh, the full stack coding uh, class. The full stack coding people is a total oblivious about the uh, failures. Okay. So we assume all the databases will never crash. Okay. So we know for sure it's, it's not true, but that we just do this anyhow. So think about this, and uh, this is what uh, we are facing, okay? This is the Achilles heel, okay? Now, how can we fix it? So you, your next question, how can we fix it, right? So it's really hard to fix, okay? So let me give you this one. Now. What's wrong with the Legs API? So remote procedure call is called, you see, if you work for defense contractors, okay? I don't know how many people in the audience if, uh, to work for Lockheed. Okay, and uh, you probably, you probably, you, you know what I'm talking about. 
<laughs> okay, in your code, in your code, the RPC is everywhere. Remote procedure is everywhere because you have to call a remote procedure to carry your mission. Okay, and you know how deadly that is. What if that remote procedure is not there? And you know for sure the probability is much be greater than zero. The guy may not be there. Okay, for whatever odd reason maybe. <clears throat> And MPI is the same way. So all the APIs are created the same way and the same vein. And then, so we all suffer. We all suffer, okay? So the client has to reach MPI this point, but everything is a one-shot deal. So, you know, our infrastructure, you see, everybody talk about the sub-infrastructure, sub -infrastructure. Well, our sub-infrastructure sub is very fragile, okay? Very fragile. We have so many single point of failures. Enemy attack one point, the whole thing collapses. They all have to do is succeed once. Okay, they succeed once and one object, one server and a whole enterprise goes down. So that is a no-no. That's why I have a DDoS. You see why DDoS is like, a, if you do a, do a security check and DDoS is increasing, the hackers know this. They attack your critical servers. So you hear the, in the news that the, the defense of the, the, the Department of Defense got a server got attacked and uh, the commerce department server got attacked and, uh, and uh, the bank server got attacked and they know what the servers are because the server had to provide a service, right? It's open to the public, sitting down. They're gonna attack you. And uh, we actually program everything with one deal, a one shot deal. So you know just how that is wrong. So the blockchain protocol actually came from anti-spam research. Now those of you who got the Hell Phoenix name and probably read that, that piece, right? So you know the very original blockchain, uh, blockchain research came from anti-spam, from email, email servers, and uh, email server, I'm, I'm an email server, and they asked me to uh, forward the message, I will forward for you, Adrian, so I'll forward for you. So how can I prevent Adrian become a spammer? So it's, Adrian can decide to become a spammer. So how do I prevent that from happening? So I'm gonna ask Adrian machine to do some calculation for me. Okay, so if you did a calculation and I, I send some message for you, if you did a lot, I save the value, say you can save some value, if you can do some more calculation, next time you don't have to do the calculation. That's the very original form of a currency, value storage, store or value. And then the problem is that uh, it's really hard to, to gauge the difficulty and uh, to have a quantitative measure of, uh, you know, how much Calculation difficulty will warrant, uh, you know, how much work gonna do for you, okay? So come up with a solution is really Satoshi's uh, uh, blockchain protocol. And then we have a second challenge, how to avoid double spending. So once you have, uh, have a credit and as a token of a value and how to avoid owner of the token to spend the same token more than once. And in finance term, it's called arbitrage, okay? When you find arbitrage, you can make an infinite amount of money in a very short time until the, the gap is called arbitrage is, is being eliminated. Okay. So arbitrage is really, you know, all the traders looking for arbitrage. Okay. If you actually uh, work for the, the stock exchange and you know, talking to traders and all traders are looking for arbitrage, actually the market being a very dynamic uh, space and arbitrage do develop over time. Adrian should know that in your, in your class. Okay. So the traders actually train it to look for arbitrage. And once they find it and they trade as fast as they can and the window will close because we trade a lot and everybody noticed that and they will shut down the, 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 the hole. Okay. <laughs> so the solution, uh, Satoshi figured out that the sequential ledger, that's why they named blockchain. Sequential linked ledger. So every transaction must be validated by the majority of the validators. So it's a very simple, simple, uh, simple protocol. And, uh, and there's some rules, okay? Some rules that uh, some concepts that the public has not yet quite understood it, okay? So a blockchain transaction, I mean, the Bitcoin transaction, and it needs to be minimal 10 minutes to validate. And you think of the modern days of a computer and uh, so you, you guys have eight core processors as the, as the, as the laptop, you know, it's especially M1, the, the Apple, Apple machine has the eight core, it's very fast, okay? 
why I needed to, 10 minutes to do the validated transactions? Well, that was intentional. Okay, intentional. The intentional is for what? The preventing double spending flaw. Okay, because that network can become partitioned. So you, you think a network the internet is always one whole piece? Uh-uh, no, it's not. Okay, the Asian, Asian country can be disconnected. European continent can be disconnected by North America at times. And it happens more often than you wish want to know. Okay, so what, when that happens and uh, the network partitions and uh, the European people will talk to themselves and uh, American people talk to themselves and then let you develop into different branches. So which one should I believe? That's a hard problem. It's called the partition tolerance. It's a really hard problem to solve, okay? So Bitcoin solved the problem by using a simple rule called the longest chain wins. So if the chain eventually, network eventually connects, eventually it will connect, like it always does, being the internet protocol. And when a chain actually trying to re reconnect and the longest one wins, the shorter ones are sorry, your transaction invalidated. Okay, so that's how big Bitcoin solved the problem. Okay, now you can hear people say, oh, blockchain is very slow. Yeah, it's slow, it's intentional. Okay, now speed is one measure, but the throughput is a definite measure. Okay, so currently the blockchain, I mean, the Bitcoin network can handle very small transaction volumes. Okay, that's a design flaw in the blockchain protocol itself because it does not know the principle of a scaling. So they know, actually the protocol developer knows probability, okay? And does not know how to make a system scale. So they do have flaws too. So for transactions worth more than a million US dollars and the current industry standard in the crypto, in the, in, in the Bitcoin world, you need to have a six confirmations and the chain will agree to, to accept your block, okay? So you can you can you can you can define say so my transaction can have to be confirmed six confirmations, and then it will be committed as a final, okay. And now once transaction is committed, is a finality, okay. There's a finality. So Pro the finality, yes, professor. Just because I I don't have too much experience with Bitcoin itself, does the time scale with the dollar amount of the money? So the one million dollar transaction takes 60 minutes, but a hundred dollar transaction take takes... less. Okay, got it. Take yes. less. Yes. I didn't I, I didn't know that, but that's good to know. Yeah, and a, a coffee shop. See in Netherlands, and it, this coffee shop will take a bitcoins. Okay. And the funny thing is that uh, you stay in the, in the back of a line and uh, you check uh, check the coffee price, and the coffee price actually changes by the time because you pay for it, and it's a different value. Okay, it's different value. And uh, that uh, transaction doesn't need a six confirmation. It's only one confirmation is good enough. And then it's a small amount calculation, so less risk. Okay, so the, you, can, you can define what the confirmation you want, okay? So now this is a 50 year computer science research did not resolve is uh, avoid, uh, avoid the centralized authority. And every, every server needs login, all right? You need to log in. And only the blockchain uh, no, don't need to log in. You don't need to log in. So all you do is go to GitHub, download the code, and compile it, and run your own machine. You can be part of the mining community. The only catch is that you never make no money. And I personally tried this myself. I run a full node in my basement. I can see all my neighbors. I have an entire ledger from a Genesis day. You know how big the hard drive it takes? 350 gigabytes. Okay, it takes a while to get down with all this. And once you have it, you have, so since the Genesis day, the very first transaction from Satoshi Nakamoto, and he sent to Elfini for 50, 50 coin transaction fee. And actually, Elfini made a lot, a lot of money because of that, okay? So 50 Bitcoin, a lot of money now. Okay, even by the time he died, and it was a lot of money. 
So the 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 mining award actually is diminishing every four years. So the very original the fifty Bitcoin, and every four years, okay, and I think the twenty thousand transaction and a cut in half. So by 2040, 2040, and it will go to zero. And then every everyone else, every transaction owner have to pay the transaction fees for someone else to process the transactions. So that's uh, how Bitcoin network works, okay? And then uh, uh, Ethereum and uh, Solana and uh, Cardano are the ones that are right now, right now hot, uh, very hot in the cryptocurrency site. And uh, they they but go by different rules. Any questions? So this is a lot. I know this is a lot. Okay, this is a lot. So there comes the, the word immutability. Okay, no database today can claim the immutability as a blockchain. The blockchain network and it promises as long as I have a single machine available. Okay, single machine by network and your ledger will be there. And that was the authentic very first ledger from the Genesis day. Oh, there's only one copy, a unique copy in the world. Okay, and no database technology can claim the same. So you want to say, what did we do wrong? Say, I'm a computer science professor, right? So I should have known this thing, okay? And I didn't until I did my research. Oh yeah, there's something we did wrong. Okay, <laughs> so Bitcoin network operate 24 seven. Okay, you have a hurricane, a snowstorm, it doesn't care. Okay, even you have a solar storm. Okay, shut down half of the world electric, electrical network. Okay, all computers crash at the same time. And then Bitcoin network will still work because the other half, the other half still have the machine running. They still have electricity. So it's that good. It's that good. Okay. So at this point, you guys know that this is how blockchain actually works. Okay. Blockchain, you request a transaction and it gets assembled into a block and then a broadcast to all the participants, the, the miners. And the miners actually will, will, will pick up the blocks and start to uh, solve the puzzles. Okay. Whoever wins first and uh, get the word. Okay, and uh, anybody loses and it just all the calculations are wasted. Do you see a problem in this picture? Anybody see a problem? Nope, nobody see a problem, huh? Well, so what I was thinking, if every transaction is stored by every single miner, then that, that's going to create a lot of data, right, over time. Or it's... Yeah, there's 350 gigabytes yeah. to this day, okay? Now, if I, see, I have 14,000 nodes running, okay, anytime, and everybody's working like crazy and try to win that. And only one of them can win. And for security, I don't need 14,000 machines, okay? And uh, I, don't, I cannot possibly see I need 14,000 validators of my, my transaction. So I don't really need that many. But uh, be, because the protocol is decentralized, I have no control over how many miners and network. The protocol is designed in such a way, it's completely opaque. The network cannot tell how many miners working on a transaction any given time. So a lot of electricity get wasted. The criticism is that uh, you're talking about a global warming and all that stuff. And this uh, Bitcoin mining will, will, will shut the, the entire planet Earth down because we, we chew up so many uh, electricity. Okay, so that's a design flaw in the Bitcoin protocol. So there are solutions, okay? So you see in the, the six steps, there are two, two phases that are very important. They're very original uh, Satoshi proposal. First is broadcast. The transit broadcast to all participants, all the nodes of mining. And the second is a second broadcast when the result is accepted and the accepted results is broadcast to all nodes. Everybody copies. Did I say copy? Yes. Copies. The copies, everybody copied except the block. So they abandon their own block calculation and accepted the block that's been confirmed. 
So all these have to be the replication. The key word is, do we know how to replicate data correctly? Do we need a 14,000 copies or need a less? So when the network grows and the copy become more, do we need a more copies of the same ledgers or not? Less. Probably we don't need that many copies, but a partition is hard. So I send Adrian a list of uh, cryptos, cryptocurrencies that you had to do some research in this, okay? I don't know how many people did that homework, okay? If you did homework and you see a lot of currencies, Adrian, you sending something? Oh yeah, I apologize. I did not send that out. So that, oh, that's that's that out. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I sent a list of cryptocurrencies and uh, all of them try to do something is called a partition. Partition the chain. Because without the partition the chain and you cannot scale. Everybody know that. Everybody knows this, but nobody knows how to, how to make that really work correctly. Okay, so that's yeah. the problem. Yes. Is this like where sharding comes in? Sharding, yes, sharding. Thank you, thank you. Sharding, yes, exactly. Okay, what well, the sharding comes in so you want to partition the ledger, and how many copies you want to partition? You partition seven copies, so you have seven copies, and you don't get a much performance gain, and your network complexity increases exponentially. So it's very hard to secure a seven chain versus a single chain, isn't it? So your security protocol take a hit. So it's a hard job. Ethereum to this day, and they claim they're going to ship for 2023, which is next year. Okay, and I doubt very much they're gonna ship it <laughs> because they cannot deliver the consensus algorithm that will actually manage the growing number of chains. It's very hard to manage the growing number of chains once you partition this. So it's a technically very challenge and, uh, and there is no, actually I know the solution, but I'm not gonna tell you, okay? So <laughs> I'll give you some light as to what it should have been, okay? But uh, people just ignore it. So why blockchain is so special? Because immutability, okay? And it promises you, it promises you that once your ledger is confirmed, it will be there in a perpetuity. Regardless of computers and the storms and uh, you know, political chaos or whatever, okay? And you move to country A to country B and your ledger will be yours, okay? And as long as it's not compromised or change and you own your private key and uh, nobody else sees it and uh, you're okay, you're fine. Okay, and uh, the story that goes that uh, somebody is a private key in the hard drive and, uh, and he accidentally lost the hard drive. Okay, and he tried to recover it, you know, tried very hard and he couldn't recover and lost all the coins that he owned. So, why is blockchain so special? Immutability is special, and data resilience is special. And a decentralized process without a central server, without, uh, you know, a Authentic server, it's a special. Zero single point is uh, zero, sub zero single point is special. Zero downtime is special. Zero data loss special. All these are special. Not check reality. No database today can claim the same. Can any database claim Oracle, Microsoft, MySQL? You know, no database can even compete. No, nobody said, like, okay, sorry, we lost. <laughs> so Computer science is actually not doing the right thing, okay? So we're not doing the real research and then we're doing the machine learning and, uh, and, uh, yeah. and data mining, but uh, can you machine learning failure? Anybody actually in the audience can help me with this, okay? Is there any way to detect the failure reliably? You see, for humans who have a light detector, even that is not reliable, right? So, is there any software can detect hardware failure reliably? Hello? Anybody? Answer is no. Okay, answer is no. no. There is, yeah, a, is no it. way, and this is in the theory, okay? It's, a, it's called information theory. So you have a bunch of machines and doing a protocol and there's an entropy created by this and the chaos, entropy is a chaos, okay? So if you introduce a detector into this already chaos enough world and the, the new detector brings too much entropy yourself, okay, yourself, and uh, you defeat yourself. If you had a method that can detect the failure reliably, 
it's a contradiction to the entire thesis from begin with. So that's how you prove it logically. You cannot have a reliable failure detector. Now, however, in industry, you see everybody doing. So I have a heartbeat, okay? So Cisco have a heartbeat. If a heartbeat's out there, the machine's dead. Yeah, okay, all right. So that, that's, that. that's your try, okay? It's not reliable failure detector, right? So think about that. It doesn't exist, okay? So it will help you sometimes, yes. There is no reliable Philip that if you cannot depend on that for your cryptocurrency, okay? So if you, see, now I'll give you an idea as to how internet works, okay? Does the internet protocol have a heartbeat in it? TCP IP, is there heartbeats in it? There's no heartbeat. <laughs> so how do the internet protocol and provide a service like Zoom that you and I talk like this, okay? I can just uh, freely telling to talk to you guys and you can freely talk to me back. And uh, we're connected by thousands of uh, router and switches. How did that work? Don't you ever wonder that? Is there a reliable failure detector in there? No, there's no reliable failure detector in this. In time, in time for a Zoom conference in infrastructure, there is no reliable failure detector. <laughs> there is a, no, there's no need for this. All right, so now legacy program paradigms are pretty much dead, pretty much dead. Now you see here's a long list. Message passing interface is a sending message to each other. Remote procedure call, you probably have a learn in your, in your programming classes. And remote method invocation, if you take a Java class, you probably know that. Share memory called open MP, and then memory map the files and name the pipe, a semaphore, signal, actor, scala, concurrent ML machine learning, okay. <laughs> So uh, Apple script, event loop, Erlog, Go, which is a new language from uh, Google, okay, the Golan, and Objective-C, Rust, Smalltalk, Hypercar, so the long, a long list, none, zero. None of them can overcome this Achilles hill. Now, what did they miss? So I'm going to skip this slide. This, you see, I'll give you the slide to Andrew when I'm done. Okay, so you guys can study this. How? So give you an example of how blockchain is the program. Okay, so you 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 do a blockchain. Say X pay one hundred dollars to Y, and here's my account number. Do you see IP address in there? Is there anywhere the IP address shows up? There's any mention of which machine should process what? There's no instruction. So therefore, and you know, this protocol is right. If at any time and it, it, the professor asks you to say, oh, you're gonna send a TCP packet to machine XYZ and this IP address, you know, that call is a doomed to fail. There will be time that XYZ may not be there. And if you put an entire infrastructure based on that call, and you you just uh, kissing your whole project goodbye <laughs> because it's a bit, it's a dead on arrival. So the protocol is strong enough to recover from extreme failure cases. So now blockchain has a public and a private separation, okay? Because the public chain is like a Bitcoin is very slow. Everybody knows that. So. And uh, people, the, the code is in GitHub. It's, a, it's open and free. Anybody can download it and compile it and study it. So you can build your own private blockchain. So a lot of banks do that, okay? So public chain is, uh, there are thousands of those. All the, uh, there are thousands of those cryptocurrencies. If you click on the link and you go to uh, Coinbase and you see thousands of cryptocurrencies. Anybody in the audience interested in launch your own currency, you can do that. Okay, so as long as you have your friends believing that you're an honest guy <laughs> and you're not going to cheat them off their money and uh, you're the new currency, it's fine. So code is open and free and you can name your own coins. Okay, like agent coin. Okay, so I'm going to issue agent coin tomorrow. So you can do that, okay? I'm not sure it will be worth a lot. But it's a learning experience, right? It's a learning experience. So there was just a, a school business, uh, it was called Be Own Boss, right? So Be Own Boss, come on. So I'm gonna have a new currency and uh, be my own boss, okay? So there are public chains and there are also private chains. Private chains for banks, central banks like private chains, okay? 
because the central bank don't really trust other central banks. So they say, okay, if we want to do business, so all the central banks should have agreement that we have a private chain. We conduct business among ourselves, not open to the public. So there's authentication to be eligible to be a miner in that network. Are we good in this? Okay, so the private blockchains and doing business among trusted partners and they're public blockchain and open to everybody. Okay, anybody can be a miner. So the difference in speed, private chain is a super fast. There's never a problem, okay? So like seven people validating, come on, it's like a fraction of a second, okay? So change the bank from uh, the, the, your money from uh, US to, uh, to, to China, it's like a fraction of a second, no problem, no, no, no issue, no issue whatsoever. Questions? Okay. And then you have, uh, you see, did anybody know what the 21 million coin offering from Bitcoin actually originally came from? And this is the equation, okay? It came from a 10 minute. So it's written in the books. This is the equation. So it came from a 10 minute per block mining, assuming 1,000 transactions per block. Okay, so 50 Bitcoin times six, so an hour, you can, one hour you can do you know, six transactions and a time 24, 24 hours a day and uh, 365 days and time four, uh, four years. Okay, every four years, every four years and it deduce the, uh, the reward by half. So the 50 BTC into zero BTC and you add them all together. It's a series, it's a mathematical series. Okay, add them all together is a 21 million coin exact. So Satoshi is really good, whoever that person may be. Okay, so it's a good in math. Okay, so he calculated the whole life cycle of Bitcoin and he's ready to go. Okay, it's a great experiment uh, after losing all his money uh, due to financial crisis in 2008. Don't you guys like the story? Yeah, rags to riches, or I guess riches to rags, then riches again. Yeah, yeah, riches to rags and riches again. And he actually fled. Nobody can catch him. Nobody could catch him. All right, so once BTC co uh, supply exhausted, user must pay the fees for the miners. And this has yet to happen 2040, and you guys will be in your primes, and I'll be in my retirement. I'll be probably moved to Florida. <laughs> now, private chains are much faster, and... Uh, Data will only be lost in the private chain if all those die at the same time. So it's pretty safe. Among all the partners that trust it, anybody crashes, not a problem. Okay, you can get a copy from all your, all your partners. So there is no problem of a failure. So no bank should be able to, you know, should claim or have a, have a downtime and because you should have a 17 server working any given moment. And because server is really, really cheap, okay? And there's a number in here, okay? Now, someone will read this slide saying, why seven? Okay, why seven? So the private chain, the, the minimal number of private chain nodes is seven. You know what, why seven? It's because of Byzantine failure calculation. To prevent two of the banks, okay? To prevent any two guys collude together to cheat the rest. So minimally, you need to have a seven guys in the network. So no two can gain up the, against anyone else. Okay, so that was the calculation. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a probability calculation. All right, so blockchain blues, and because blockchain, I said the flaws. Now, what are the flaws? First of all, there's a regulatory challenge, okay? You cannot regulate blockchain because it's anonymous, okay? If, if all accounts are encrypted. You cannot see the account details, okay? You see the transaction going through from A to B, B to C, but you don't know who owns it. So governments are generally hostile. So US government is pretty open to this. And actually US government is thinking about the issue, their own digital currency in a closed chain, not public chain. Okay, guys, now pay attention. They say, oh, we're gonna have our own digital, digital currency. Oh, we're gonna do our own digital, like China. China already had digital, digital currency, okay? So we control the issuance. You know what? It's the same as the fiat money. 
Okay, if a government control this and they can issue whatever coin they, they want it, come on, your wealth will be robbed in, on the daylight. Okay, so like a split second, you disappear. Whatever you own, the agent owns $20 million. Like in the next second, you own nothing. You, you owe me back. <laughs> they say, owe me back. Okay, you owe me 20 million. Okay, it's so only electronic records. So centralized control, you cannot regulate it, and, but you, you cannot regulate, but you cannot not regulate. Because the illicit activities in, in, on the chain going on, so the weapon trafficking, human trafficking, all that, the drug, drug trafficking, all bad things happen, okay, because of anonymity. So how do you have the best of both worlds without having the, you know, deal, deal with the problems? So my prediction, I have a prediction here, okay? Cryptocurrency will persist, will be with us for a long time to come. Governments cannot shut them down because there are native applications, I mean, killer apps that will never go away. There are people volunteer to do the nodes, to run a, run a, run a, run a mining software. And uh, there are people willing to be part of the ecosystem. So you cannot kill them all. There's no way you can, you can limit them. But uh, there is a scaling challenge though. First of all, every single node have to hold the entire ledger. That's a no, no, isn't it? So my hard drive, I have pretty, pretty, pretty big hard drive. I have a two, two or four terabytes, okay? But I know for one day it's gonna run out. So what, what if it happened to all the guys that are like me? So you basically kicking us out of the game. Right, so don't you think that the one day all the servers will max out? So when, until then, and the blockchain will continue to operate, and if all servers max out, and the entire chain will crashing down, and you can see that it's coming. That's number one. Number two is you add a node in there, a majority, and it does not improve performance. So the guy don't see you. He's going to see, oh, use use a blip, and you don't don't get awards, but uh, you're not contributing anything. You can chip in a little uh, resilience, okay? So anybody else dies, can get a copy from you. So that's all it does. It is nothing else. Because my computer, I can see my network is busy all the time. I get the, the, the copies that are transmitted. I get a copy of a transaction being closed. So the add-in chain, I got a copy, okay? But I never, can, I never get a chance to mine anything. So I never get assignments. So I never make any money. Because my machine is not fast enough. So private chain also has a scalability and you add a partner and your, your, your validation time increases. So this is like a totally opposite. Okay, you add a node, should the, should the, should the improve the performance, right? And it doesn't. So your validation time increases. You have seven partners into eight partners. The eight guys have to agree with the, uh, validate your transaction. So the time, the time actually grows longer. So the scalability says, you add a node into the into the to the infrastructure. You should increase the performance, and this is a decrease performance. That's a problem. You know, you cannot do this. Okay, you cannot grow. The baby was uh, pretty much uh, staying baby forever in life. Whatever the life goes, it's a diminishing life actually. So the blockchain, uh, the vulnerability changes, scalability war. There's a war of a scalability, okay? In the, in, the, in the crypto world, there's a war on this, okay? First is a proof of a work, is a, is a Bitcoin, is a consensus algorithm, and a proof of stake. So I don't know how many people know proof of stake. I think you guys know this, right? Yeah, 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 sure. yeah people yeah. know this. Yeah, so the proof of stake is that you want to be a miner and you don't have to log in, but you have to put in some money. It's the collateral, okay? So, so put in $20, I will be a miner, okay? And then I charge you, then I take money off. But if you disconnect from network, you get a charge, okay? If you produce a wrong block, okay? And you produce a block and everybody else disagree and you get penalized. So that's a, a, proof, of a, a proof of stake algorithm, okay? It's a much faster than a proof, proof of work, okay? So Cardano, Cardano and uh, right now Solana. Solana is uh, actually uh, is a leading leading in charge. Solana has uh, some same called proof of history, okay. And on top of proof of a uh, proof of stake, so they have a little timeline in the back, and uh, to add more security uh, on on the top. But uh, they suffer because of the timeline. 
You see, think about it during the timeline. How do you keep the timeline in one place? In the server. If that server goes dead, how do you validate things? That's why Solana crashed for 17 hours. Too many transactions because everybody, all the investors interested. Solana claim can do 50,000 transactions per second, which is a lot. It's almost like a, you know, like a visa, okay? So that itself is a myth. Transaction profit and speed, how many transactions can you process per second is a myth, okay? Now, does anyone in this audience know Alibaba, the company Alibaba in China, guys? Yep. Jack, sorry about Jack Ma. Jack Ma, Dude. that's right, yeah. Now, if you ever been in China and you have an application called the WeChat, okay, and you tie your credit card, your money account with WeChat, it can do a lot of things in China, okay? You can buy a bowl of soup, okay? You can buy food, you can rent a bike, and uh, you, you just put your, your scan the QR code and you got what you wanted. Super fast. You know how many people in China? <laughs> like 1.4 billion, I think. So how did Alibaba handle transaction processing rate? And nobody ever talked about it. Isn't it? So Visa is a peanuts. So Visa is kind of 75 transactions per second. It's peanuts. Compared to Alibaba, it's peanuts. Okay. Alibaba handles like a billion transactions a second. Okay. Now, what is the secret? Partition. Partition. You see, when I go to Shanghai to see my, say, see, to see my mother, see my home, uh, see, see, see my hometown, and uh, I can rent a bike and buy scanning QR code. And uh, it gets processed right away. And the, 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 the bike will automatically unlock and I just ride until, until I don't need it and I put it back and I lock it again, scan again, I'm done, okay? Now process is really fast. And I did not know the server processing my transaction right next door. Partitioning, okay? So anybody learn computer science and uh, you know, you have enough servers that China has a, a plenty of servers everywhere, okay? <laughs> everywhere. Okay, you can handle this. The performance speed is not a problem. It should not even be in a challenge. But why it is a challenge for blockchain? The protocol has a flaw. All right, so the ledger partition is a key challenge, but the multi-chain, I told you, multi-chain partition is just a brain dead. But a lot of people still try it, okay? Solana should try it, and then uh, Cardano, is, uh, is also trying an Ethereum version two, and uh, they claim to be come out the uh, year 2023, and it's still struggling with the consensus algorithm. Of how do you handle how do you handle consensus algorithm? Have multi chain in place, and the chain can grow. So according to uh, you know Vitalik Buterian, he said oh, there's something called a snark algorithm can solve the problem, and the snark is not there yet. Okay. So with a green number chance and they couldn't figure out the math. Okay, the math is super complicated. All right, so this is a problem and uh, the vulnerability is also in crypto exchanges. And if you don't resolve that problem and whatever you're saving the money and it can be, you know, a heist. So people can steal money at the exchange. So exchange vulnerability must be addressed. And then I'm going to give you this uh, needed for crypto 2.0. Okay, this is my uh, closing slide, almost closing slide. Okay, expanding your process infrastructure must increase the performance and reliability of your service. Okay, at the same time and not compromise security at all. If you cannot meet these three requirements, your protocol is a failure. Okay, it's a pretty tough bar to, to cross, but it's necessary not only for financial services, for anything mission critical. And this is the only criteria will be acceptable for self-driving cars, for nuclear power plant monitoring systems, for anything that we actually, hospitals, patient, patient uh, watch and all that. University of uh, uh, Temple and it has to have the same infrastructure because we should not have a, a campus shut down because the one server goes dead. Isn't that Adrian? <laughs> so we do need that, okay? And we need the performance. And uh, is that scalable? 
uh, service available? And she says, yes. And she says, yes. The internet is a living example, you see. And uh, one thing that I can challenge you guys, and uh, all man-made structures cannot be too big. The building behind me, if built too tall, it will collapse. The bridge is too wide, it will fall. Yes? So any build too big will collapse, except for the internet. Does anyone ever worry about the internet will actually go bust one day? And uh, what is the DNA in the internet that we don't understand? And uh, that enables the indefinite youth is always young. So how do you get this always young, you know, that, that, that medicine and uh, built into our system and then uh, we'll be okay. Not watch, okay? And now this is a current FinTech uh, uh, affairs, okay? So you all have a confidence in fiat money is dwindling for sure, okay? And interest in digital currency is sweeping the world, even though it's really going down in the, for the last two days, okay? People lose a lot of money, okay? The, the market is going down. And uh, play up by times, it's, it's, there is something called a SOX. You see, this is probably you guys don't know, okay? The federal government got involved because of financial crisis and uh, the companies, oh, we so went down that uh, people, the customer lost money. We, so technology is not, is not uh, it's, it's not our fault. It's a technology fault. Okay, the federal government involved and it's called the rule called the SOX. Sabin Oxley as the two senators name, Sabin Oxley, Sabin and Oxley, two senators proposed so every business must have a disaster recovery site for mission critical use, okay? And this is for, this is 2002 to now. This is like, uh, you know, 20 years ago, okay? Now this caused the entire industry and to buying servers. And uh, all the, the Wall Street banks that have a service on Northern Jersey and they call it data bunkers, okay? And, uh, <laughs> And what these servers do? Nothing. Copy, copying data. They don't do much. They don't do much. Okay, data bank do do much. Okay. So almost every every bank has a research arm in cryptocurrency. Everybody's interested in this. So you know there's something in there that interests the financial industry. Interesting. Yeah, I never knew that Sarbane Oxley had that because they always. That's obviously after Enron and all the issues there. 911 911 911 yeah 911 okay that makes sense yeah 911 so when a building coming down and a northern jersey bunker helped to save the save the world actually not only usa because all the banking records are savaged so now become the saving oxley rule and then uh, so a lot of companies try to, to get away with it because it's expensive keep the data center running doing nothing is very expensive Okay, so business we have a saying is called uh, this, the, so all these uh, DR site is considered cost of uh, doing business as written on the accounting rule as a cost of doing it. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a non-taxable item. <laughs> cost, of, cost of the business, they do a tax that you understand. So I can deduct that from income, okay. So now we're gonna go a little faster, okay? Because this is a lot. I don't want to go to to make you too long. And uh, lesson from uh, so this is a slide that you guys will have interest, okay? In 1983, MIT and run experiment, okay? Very interesting experiment. They have FTP, okay? File transfer protocol, and if I'm machine A to machine B to machine C machine D, and I send a file, send a, a very large file from beginning of day to the end of the day. So at the end of the day, they will check if the two files from a source node to the end node, are they the same? Guess what happened? The source file and the target file are different. So every node is honestly checkpointed and it's a, it's a checksum and validated. So how is that? Yeah, I can see there's a... Yeah, okay, see that. Yeah, so, so, so it really is being bullish. It's good to so become bullish in the crypto is a good idea, okay? But however, you can put, I'm gonna put a grain of salt in this, okay? Have you 
have you think twice before you can bet on any cryptocurrency. Okay, you have, to, you have to look at the underlying protocol. What protocol are you running? You have to ask the question. So what protocol are you running? What the, the, what's your consensus algorithm? Are you doing POW or POS? And what kind of POS? Do you have a proof of history? Ask a list of questions before you buy into it. Okay, Cardano is actually going down right now. Okay, so it's a lost, uh, lost something. So I'm <laughs> watching this myself. Do you have a record or do you, are you? No, no, no. I don't know recommendation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, I don't know recommendations, guys. Disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So is there okay is a question. What's that? Is it okay if I ask a question about a specific? Yes, yes, protocol? please. Yes, yes, please. Are you familiar with Loop Ring? Actually not. Okay. Okay. You should oh. check that out. It's an Ethereum. It's an Ethereum scaling solution. They're doing uh, zero knowledge proofs. Oh yeah, that I heard that one. I heard that one. So I think uh, cool. Snark Snark is zero knowledge proof. Zero yeah, knowledge exactly. proof. Zero knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Snark is zero knowledge proof. So it's very hard to have a zero knowledge from a seven chains, don't you think? And uh, suppose the chain grows into twenty thousand chains. How do you have a zero knowledge from a twenty thousand separate chains? Loop ring supposedly like batches transactions together and like stamps them as like certified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, See, I think uh, they're into a, a jungle of math. They can never come out. Okay. But I uh, see, we learn, we should learn from the past. The history told us, okay. And told us this is written in, actually was written in 1952. So let me give you the, is it written in 1952? <laughs> See. This is a gentleman I want you guys to remember. Hungarian. Okay. It was written in 1952. Before he left the world, he left a piece of writing and telling everybody, you can build an arbitrary reliable system using unreliable components. All you have to do is do one thing. You know what that is? Called statistic multiplexing. That's how internet has its longevity. So you see my slide here, I can, I can leave you. So the internet, internet longevity came from that single phrase, statistic multiplexing. You don't need a snark. There's no need for a snark, okay? It's absolutely unnecessary, okay? The math complexity is totally waste, total waste. In my opinion, in my opinion, okay? <laughs> now, don't ask me to push my own coins, okay? Maybe one day I will. Okay, you hear you hear some, some somewhere. Okay, the internet DNA actually was written by von Neumann, okay, Hungarian, and uh, all the hop to hop protocols are bad, so we know that. And but what's the replacement? So how do you replace it? Can we all do a Bitcoin protocol? Uh, 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 it's uh, too slow. Okay. So technically speaking. How would you program anything without assuming the device is reliable? So that's a challenge, okay? How can we teach programming without assuming reliable networking, ne reliable uh, processor, reliable storage? How do we even write program? Lots of if statements. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier than you think, guys. Easier than you think, okay? Easier than you think, okay? So the top program fallacy is assuming that network reliable. You cannot assume network reliable. So you must learn how to do retransmission, okay? But you need a runtime to help you, okay? Without that runtime and um, to help you, you cannot do statistic multiplexing. So the teaching that we have done in universities and schools and it has been flawed for years, okay? I have a saying that's a, at the National Science Foundation talks and everybody you know, wanted to, to, to kick me out of the meeting because they don't like to hear me saying this, okay? So what I'm saying to everybody, to, to you as well, is the way we teach programming is wrong by assuming the hardware is reliable. We have to teach students how to program assume the hardware is not reliable especially in operating system class. We have to learn how to build the, the software infrastructure, software, not, not hardware, to deal with the hardware unreliabilities. That's what Von Neumann left. Piece of writing, he didn't know how to program it.
But he left the theory, he said, hey, somebody going to take the idea and move to the finish end. Then he died. Okay? So now I'm picking up the work. Okay? And we're going to continue on this and make sure this happens. His vision can be realized. And it can, can be. So Bitcoin is a one step towards the right direction. At least your failure is no longer an issue. So next challenge is how to deliver performance without compromised security, right? So that is the research peek into the future, okay? So I'll give you something, so, so, something that's a, the, is a concept, okay, this is a concept, okay? The concept is when we, when we get a data, when we want a data from other places, so, um, from network, we should never ask for data because of the machine IP address. So the machine IP address should be out of the loop. So therefore the network is not only for communication, it's for data retrieval. So there's a concept called the active content network addressable networking. So this is my invention. Okay, my invention because I've done this for, for a long time. And I have an invention to claim that you can make an entire network content addressable and also active. And that will solve problem. Okay. And then I can show you that you can have infinite scalability. So whatever transition 70,000 70, per second is peanuts. We can do 20 million transactions, 200,000 million billion transactions per second. No problem, no sweat, just like Alibaba. Okay, no problem. The entire country, 14 billion people doing the WeChat any, any, any minute, any day, there's no sweat. As long as we do the partition correctly. And then we still have a zero knowledge proof and no deviation from original consensus algorithm. So that's the killing part, right? That's a really cool part, isn't it? All right. So now what about quantum computing? You heard of quantum computing, right? <laughs> so you're going to quantum computing. So I can prove to you mathematically. So if you use a content addressable networking the concept, as I was saying to you, and you can claim unlimited scale. So performance gap on a so performance scale like a Visa processing speed is no big deal, okay? You can deliver anything you want. It's infinite, infinite. So infinite is a mathematical symbol. It's bigger than any number that you can come up with, including quantum computer. Now, this is a big claim. So you can actually produce a worldwide computer faster than any single quantum computer. And you can subsume quantum computer into the calculation if you wanted to. So that is the, uh, so the M does law and I'm gonna spare you over this. And the whole thing comes down to this, 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 this a figure and I teach an operating system class, okay? So this is a misunderstanding in the world. People don't understand M's law, M does law, okay? So once you understand M's law, you know what the I said is actually, it can be true because it's a mathematically provable. You can have infinite scaling. As long as your problem size open. So for all, all of us in, involved in here, we want any service, it's useful service, can grow to serve more people, right? So therefore the problem size is growing indefinitely. So as long as the problem size is growing infinitely, your performance can grow indefinitely. So there is no top end. There should never be a top. So whatever the industry is talking about, oh, 70,000 transactions per second is visa processing, that's not really technically sound, okay? So it's not, that's not limited and that's not the top, okay? And I can do a lot better. To talk to Jack Ma, he tell you, he actually, he can blow 70,000 uh, to the water any minute, okay? So now FinTech and service infrastructure is interdependent, okay? Financial industry is inter interdependent with sub-infrastructure. It's a mission critical, zero loss feasible, unlimited performance feasible, unlimited scalability feasible. And uh, this is a web 3.0 ready once you have a content addressable networking and then it's a web 3.0 ready. We don't need it. We need a central computing 
decentralized processing. And we also support decentralized computing with decentralized processing. So we can have authority. You can regulate. You can also without have authority and without regulation. It depends on the applications. So that is pretty much the talk that I have prepared for you. This is about me and this is, uh, so I earned a master's degree and a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. And in 1980, <laughs> it's been a long time, <laughs> 1983, 1984. Okay, I came to this university in 1985 and I never left. So I was elect chairman of a department 2007, 2009 and associate chairman to 2010 to 2015. And uh, I've been researching in this area for the last 30 some years. So the invention that I have uh, filed with the university is applicable to cryptocurrencies, databases, file system, object or stores for financial transaction processing and controlling deep space probes and all many vehicles, nuclear power plants, and the software-defined networks and the smart grids. So the end.